very bad with technology. I'm just going to use a handheld mic now. Um, so for those of you who know me, um, you'll know I joined Consumers International back in April 2019. That was one month before our last global congress. And it was an amazing moment. Um, it, this is a community of uh, incredible advocates from all around the world. They are incredible because they put people first. They think about people's hopes and their dreams, and they see how those are expressed in the marketplace. It's a global and a div diverse community as well, and one that, you know, if, if I can paraphrase my president, Marimutu Nadasan, uh, we act from hope, not fear. And uh, to quote uh, and requote uh, Rose Mpofu, who is the board member for Consumers International from the African continent, uh, she constantly reminds us that no one should be left behind. So this is a, a wonderful community, and I'm so pleased that though we have gone through a great deal in those four years, who knew when we were standing there together in 2019 what would come, um, we are together again. And uh, it is wonderful to see familiar faces, to see new faces, and to bring this community together with leaders who likewise care about people in the marketplace and a fair, safe, and sustainable marketplace for all of us. I'm gonna do a quick recap, and I'm sure I'll forget half of the things uh, that we've done together, but if we have a vision for making sustainable consumption the norm, for making the online marketplace work for all of us, for strengthening the voice of consumers in the marketplace, we have achieved a lot in the last couple of days. Um, on sustainability, we have launched a new methodology for measuring food prices and finding ways to strengthen competition. We have highlighted that consumers need to be with the, uh, the energy transition and how can we integrate and empower them. We have shared new insight uh, on how consumers can be helped from intention to action and the marketplace supports them. Um, and we have talked about how this sustainability information needs to work, needs to be harmonized, needs to be clear to enable us in that transition. On the digital uh, front, we have done a great deal. We have launched a new initiative looking at how the data flows, the pipes and the data that flows through that needs to work for redress. We have launched our call for World Consumer Rights Day around fair and responsible AI. Um, we have focused on digital finance and not only brought together our amazing grantees, eight around the world uh, as part of our accelerator who are doing amazing work to bring people into shaping digital finance. We have launched yet more efforts which will now be global. Um, I am sure I have forgotten many, many. How could I forget the Scams Alliance? Uh, I think over 20 of our members now have been part of an anti-scams alliance uh, to call for really the core of trust to be built back into the marketplace. So just a few there, and I would invite you uh, to, to raise your hand and share anything else that you feel has been particularly um, impressive during these days together. Um, I do want to thank those who are hosting us, the government of Kenya will come to those in a second, and the Competition Commission of Comesa have been extraordinarily wonderful partners in building this together. And our members, we have 20 members here from across the African continent. You have been wonderful in giving us guidance and support, and we will call on you at the, on the, at the end, if I may, to stand up um, and be recognized. Now, it is really difficult. We're, of course, sitting here. Um, I, I, we, as a team, have been thinking about how we build this. We need external perspective, and that's why we have an amazing uh, panel here to help us reflect, to give an outside perspective on why, what, what have we learned, what can we take away, and where should we go next. The four years ahead of us I would love to say that it might be quieter than the last four. Um, I, I, I think per the theme of the, the con Congress here, we need to continue to build resilience in the face of crises. And I know 
based on what I've seen over the far past four years, that we can do that together. To my right, I have Gilly Wong, who is the CEO of the Hong Kong Consumer Council. She's the, my vice president, so she's one of my bosses. Um, Gilly, tell me, why was this Congress so important for Consumers International, and what were you hoping we'd achieve? Well, I think um, just to share a little bit, you know, uh, at the back, you know, kind of um, uh, background to every one of you. Um, remember, uh, the past four years, actually, you know, every one of us has experienced a very challenging time. Uh, remember the COVID uh, from personal side, family, uh, organization, and also global level, you know, it is a huge challenge for the world. And when we think about, you know, this World Congress, we have a lot of uncertainties. Remember that uh, we talk about, should we make it online only? Can we make it hybrid? Will people come? Uh, is there any change in our members' behavior? You know, not, don't want to see each other again, you know, but to Zoom, keep Zooming. Lots of, lots of debates, uh, but at the end, you know, uh, we conclude the fact that, you know, we are all human beings. We love to meet each other and we treasure the friendship and here we are. That um, thanks to the support from the African uh, partners, you know, that we make it to happen. Um, this World Congress, you know, is extremely important for every one of us uh, in the room, no matter it is only our members, also stakeholders, including the regulators, um, civil societies, as well as the businesses, also very important. Why? It's because the consumption environment, in actual fact, is getting a lot more complex than before. May I have a raise of hands, you know, do you agree that, you know, the consumption environment, as compared with four years before, is even more complex? Yeah, many of us, right? So it's even post more challenge to um, every one of us. If we can, if we work along, you know, this is very impossible. In different sessions, you know, we all share the um, the difficulty of uh, being alone. Uh, do we have the right resources, manpower, skills, knowledge, uh, etc., to handle the challenges that we face? But um, the answer is definitely. No, we need collaboration, we need to exchange, we need to share ideas, we need to brainstorm, we need to support each other. And seeing is believing, you know, today, after all the uncertainties, you know, that we debate uh, in the past, we finally have over about 300 people. Also, we have many people online, you know, to join us in this global congress. And as I mentioned right at the beginning, uh, um, in the Gen AI dialogue, it's just the beginning because uh, I can see um, from different uh, members, uh, you get a lot of ideas and also f new friendship plus uh, partnerships as well that you know, we will continue to uh, develop the consumer protection movement together globally. So this is so important. And uh, we have started talking about uh, what's next, you know, four years after, where we should go to. Probably you know, everyone can give us some ideas you know, where you want to go to and also what are the... Um, um, the agenda, you know, that we want to shape as well, you know, uh, in advance. So I really feel, you know, this is a worth uh, trip, you know, to make, even though for me from Hong Kong all the way to here is a very long trip, but uh, no regret, it's really worth it. And I hope, you know, everybody will share the same feeling as well. Thank you so much, Gilly. I think we were in the competition for who flew the faster, the furthest. I think we got to 41 hours. Um, but probably there, are, there, are, there is further than that. So worth it, really thank you for making that effort and taking the time to be here. Adano, if I may call you that, um, the Deputy President, His Excellency, uh, joined us at the very start and pointed to a number, the importance of consumer protection, the importance of consumer policy. Uh, he highlighted in particular food digital finance. Um, he, he also pointed to tourism at the end, which I think a, a, a number have, uh, have taken advantage of. Um, question to you, have we achieved what we set out to as partners coming here to raise uh, visibility of the need for better consumer protection? And uh, is there anything that's really stood out to you as, as an achievement or a takeaway? Thank you very much, Elena, and thank you very much to all of you. I'm deeply honored to, to host all of you in Nairobi and also as a competition agency in Kenya. Um, yes, I, I think we have achieved what we said to do, and we haven't achieved some of them because it's, some of them is a takeaway for us in this uh, forum. Uh, one of the things that the uh, Deputy President mentioned was consumer protections in the advancement of technologies. And I think we have very fruitful discussion starting with the first plenary session uh, during the Congress, 
and therefore I think that we have achieved. And the other item that I think we had really achieved is in terms of getting our heads around consumer prices, uh, high prices around the globe, and how are we going to address them or how are we addressing them. I think that's a conversation that is relevant to all of us across the globe, and no one is left out. And I think that's the role that consumer associations and consumer congress should play as, as a whole. Uh, the other item that uh, Deputy President mentioned was, can we harmonize our regulations and framework for consumer protections across the globe and across Africa for that matter? And I think that's the work that we need to take forward. Uh, all of us are not at the same level of consumer protection or recognizing association that are going to work for consumer, uh, consumer bodies in all our interests. And I think that's something that I, I feel we should take it back all the experiences and learnings we have taken from here, we shouldn't be left in Nairobi, checking back and have a discussion around those issues because they affect all of us and many of us affected. The issues around scam, I think is another important agenda and consent in times of digitization. How do we treat consumer uh, consent? How do we use information that consumers are not aware as business entities? And I think there's a need to observe uh, practices that in line with both consumer interest and business interest as well. And I think one, my final point will be that collectively, as consumer associations, at all levels, we have a better voice in all the issues that we discuss. And therefore, collective voice, I think, is something that we need to take back home. And cooperation and collaboration, not only among us, but also with other agencies and like-minded institutions is what we should do going back. And I think that's one of the key messages that we like to take, collaboration and cooperation across institutions and entities, and therefore consumer associations should not be left behind. Thank you so much. And if we look forward to 2024, we'll come back to this. Uh, UNCTAD, um, so where consumer and competition policy is held at the United Nations, will of course look at how governments can support consumer organizations in July, if I can see Arnau, who will be holding a discussion straight after this during lunch. Uh, where are you? Stand up. There we are. Wonderful. And there will be discussion even after lunch or during lunch on that. And then looking forward, the OECD ministerial later in the year. So a great uh, opportunity for us to continue these conversations forward at international level, uh, following building on your call for collaboration here. Um, Rebecca, you are a great champion, especially for bringing consumer and competition policy together, for making sure that consumers' data is uh, recognized, valued, that we set up the system so that it is fair, um, if I can paraphrase poorly your great eloquence. Um, uh, Rebecca is, of course, as you've seen her from the start of this in the generative AI session. She is a commissioner for the Federal Trade Commission. And um, in fact, we learned as we went through, has a personal connection here to Kenya, speaks uh, Swahili, and uh, it is fantastic to, to have her with us. Rebecca, your takeaways uh, from your time here with us. There we go, thank you. Also not with the technological skills. Um, it's such an honor to be here. I'm so grateful to our Kenyan hosts and our Comesa hosts and to Consumers International for having me. Um, it really is a privilege to get to be a part of this uh, Congress and be among so many impressive, powerful, dedicated advocates for real people who are participating in markets all over the world and just want a fair shake. At the end of the day, I mean, what we want is for people to have a fair shake in the economies in which they live. And so, you know, my takeaways that, the, the two takeaways that I'd point to are first, even though the people in this room and in this Congress represent so many different countries, so many different regions um, that are that are different in many ways, different laws, different cultures. There is so many common threads between what all of us are seeing in the markets in which we operate around the world, common threads in terms of the problems that people are facing, the issues that are emerging, 
the way technology is affecting people's lives, sustainability issues, um, and that commonality is uh, really important for us to recognize. And then the other takeaway I've been really impressed with is the um, creativity in everybody's approaches to these problems. And, and I think uh, conversations like this and convenings like this are so important for us to learn from each other and to learn from the creative approaches in different jurisdictions, um, understand what's working well, what could be working better. Um, from an enforcement perspective, that's hugely valuable. But even I think among the advocacy and civil society community, it can be enormously grateful, uh, enormously valuable. So I'm very grateful to be a part of it. Thank you. We're grateful to have you here. Um, may I come to Sheila now? Uh, Sheila Agarwal Khan is uh, joining us straight from COP28, um, and she is heading up, as a number of you did, and Angela, of course, at the end as well. So thank you very much for coming to the to the place where we can talk about sustainable consumption. Um, yeah. uh, Sheila heads at uh, the United Nations uh, Environment Program. Their, all of their global work on markets and industry, so a key voice here. Um, Sheila, I would love to hear from you. you know, we have really tried to be part of the plastics negotiation treaty, just as one point. We, of course, work with Ulf and Arnau also within the program on consumer information. Um, have you seen that expressed here in the work that we've done? Uh, what's your takeaway? And then I'll come back to the panel. What's next? So I think it's very interesting to see, actually, if you look at the environment space, it has gone into a completely different space from 10, 20 years ago. Um, so now we have the COP um, happening in Dubai, but we've also had a global biodiversity framework approved uh, <clears throat> a year or so ago, and a global chemicals framework approved just in September in Bonn. And so, and what we're seeing with industry actors is there is really a push to go from corporate social responsibility to what's happening in their core programs. I'll give you one example, which is our partnership with commercial banks and institutional investors, where 40% of the financing going through banks globally is in our partnership, and they're all looking at their net zero nature positive targets. What does it mean for them in their decisions that they will take? So it is really not about those little slivers of space. And I see the same kind of discussion here. It's not just about the eco-labeling environment. It's really broadly about consumer information in general. And how does this go into a different space? Now, when I'm engaged on the, in the last couple of days here, I see a lot of movement here. But I see it missing, actually, in, in some of the global processes. Um, we had the global plastics negotiations happening just a month ago in Nairobi, and actually many industry actors from the upstream industry side said consumers are not ready for, for looking at sustainability. They, don't, they want us to give us these products that are, well, unsustainable. Um, plastic packaging being a really big issue, but beyond packaging, just the pol pollution from a lot of plastic that is mismanaged. And, but the consumer voice was there, but it was not loud enough. And so, so it was very nice to have some of you there, but I think it needed to have as big a voice as some of the other, let's say, naysayers um, in the rooms. And I think that's true for many processes. I do, I do want to recognize Saroja from CAG Chennai and one of our council members um, who's been actually representing us in those processes with her team because we can't be everywhere. Um, we're actually a very tiny team. And what's fantastic is our members represent us in these processes. So just leaving that as the thought for the next four years. Um, and let's raise that voice together because we're being called for. Bob. Bob Hedges is the chief data officer at Visa. Um, he uh, stewards their work on privacy and I think gave us a really fascinating snapshot of how he does that in a very uh, engaging conversation um, and has launched with us this work to make sure that the conversations at the G7, at the G20, consider consumer redress, not just how that data flows well for business. It's important yet. How does that affect us? Um, thank you so much for being with us and for engaging throughout the program. What were your key takeaways? Sure. Um, thank you, Helena. And thank you for inviting me. And um, 
thank you uh, for everyone welcoming me. It's been a, a, a really enjoyable and uh, learning couple days. Um, three things. I think the first one, you know, a, a, as a guest coming with a, a, a briefcase or a laptop full of research, I had a certain set of expectations regarding sharing information and had the chance to do that. And, and uh, that was awesome. And for those who came to the session, thank you for a, attending. But the, the three things that struck me was there's already this shared view that if the digital commerce and data ecosystem doesn't work for consumers, then it doesn't work, right? And if the digital commerce and data ecosystem doesn't work for small businesses, then it doesn't work. And all these systems that we point to and talk about how large they are and the number of participants and the growth rates, but if there's large constituencies of consumers or small businesses that have no confidence in it and therefore don't participate, like we have a big problem, even though the percentages show growth and all that wonderfulness. So that sort of really struck me, uh, the, the, that, that shared view and sort of the reframing of how we should think about the work. Um, the second thing that struck me uh, and was a was uh, imp personally really impactful was the whole conversation about scams and fraud, and um, I'm going to butcher people's names, but I want to thank Rosie for running a, a great panel because it was potent and powerful. Um, and in my role, we often think about fraud, but we don't think about scams, and we think about people not participating, but we don't think about why, right? And so that was a great learning session. That it was a big takeaway. But the other part of it, and I, I can't remember the name of the gentleman from New Zealand, but um, he says something that stuck with me and is going to stick with me, and I have it in all my notes. And that educate, consumer education cannot be a vehicle for shifting accountability. And there's an attitude. Uh, that, that, not, I mean, let me start the sentence again. There's a danger in being satisfied that consumer education by itself gets the job done. And that was a big learning. Thank you very much for articulating it the way that you did, mm -hmm. because that has me rethinking a lot of the things we're trying to do about focusing on <laughs> using that to increase accountability as opposed to shift it, right? And that, that reframing was useful. Um, and then uh, the, 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 my third takeaway was the, the readiness for concrete action, right? You know, there's, there's always the danger of defining things as abstract and admiring the problem and once again making the case for change. And, and, and I detect a sense of impatience about that, about let's actually get some things done, like now, like let's agree, right? Let's put programs in motion. And that's um, exciting because uh, uh, we're always looking for partners to get things done. And there's a whole room full of them. And, and I'm so happy I came. Thank you so much. And John Duffy, I think that you were the author of that quote. I think you started your job the same time as I did. First time we've managed to meet. So thank you to Congress for that and all of those who supported it. We will get to thanks at the end. Great to see you here. Angela. Um, Angela Lungati is uh, the CEO of Ushahidi. Uh, Ushahidi is a Kenyan NGO um, which uses technology to join together communities so that they can act. And you're now all over the world. Um, it's extraordinary. I'd love to, you to share a little bit of what you do, in fact, um, before you start. My key question to you is sort of as you look at what we've done, what stuck out to you? I have a second question, though, because we're going to start the flow again. As an NGO, right, we're civil society, we're not for profits, we are being squeezed in every way. How do we look to the next four years? How do we not just thrive, but survive? Because what we stand for matters. How do you think about that? So just a few points in there. <laughs> Those are three points. 
Um, so th thank you so much, Elena, and thank you so much uh, for, for having me. Um, so um, brief background into the work that we do. Uh, we are a global organization whose focus is empowering disenfranchised communities through access to data and technology. So the whole idea is um, <clears throat> using the tools that they already have access to, to elevate and raise their voices, and then have that be used for advocacy and push for the change that uh, we want to see in the world. So I'm particularly excited about being on this panel, uh, given that it does fall squarely within our ballpark in terms of work. Um, Unfortunately, I wasn't here for the last couple of days, but just from looking at some of the different conversations that have been uh, have been going on, um, I think the one that has struck me the most, and I think is probably a conversation that we are continually having, is recognizing the opportunities that emerging technologies have, but then also recognizing that they also present a significant amount of risk uh, to consumers, and that if we don't approach those uh, with caution, then you know we, we are putting people at risk. Um, and the challenge around that is really around the fact that some of our governance and regulatory and policy frameworks aren't catching up fast enough. And we do need some, some, some speed of action around that. Um, in a couple of different conversations, I think I, I, I do resonate with the point around um, consumer education not shifting uh, the, the the balance when it comes to accountability because sometimes that seems like it's a magic bullet, but really about it being the thing that helps to um, increase or advance that um, in some ways. And if I may also share <clears throat> one other point that also resonates from my experience at COP is that there seems to be a hunger to accelerate action rather than keep talking uh, about it. And so in line with your question around what I see happening over the next four years or what it looks like, I think we really need to focus a lot on collaboration. Collaboration really is going to be key, and I've heard that um, also from uh, some of the other panelists, looking beyond our regional boundaries, but looking at it also at a global scale, because some of the challenges that we're facing are cross boundaries. You know, they happen across uh, different boundaries. So what is it that we can learn from one another? Um, and, you know, you know, is it building uh, joint learning networks of sorts, but then also giving space to adapt that to um, our different uh, contexts? And around the partnerships as well, thinking about partnering with the unusual suspects. So people that we don't tend to partner with uh, before. Um, so that would be my largest takeaway. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angela. Gilly, I'm going to leave you to the end so we can wrap up together, if that's okay. Yeah, awesome. So may I come back to Adano? So now looking ahead the next four years, because we don't want Congress to be a one-off. We, we have built this great collaboration. How can we continue to work? How can, and the Kenyan uh, consumer organizations, would you stand up, um, those of you who are here, so that we can recognize you? and say hello, you should be here. I know we have Kenya Consumer Organization there at the back, and Consumer Grassroots. Alice, it's wonderful to have you on board, please. You know, Consumer Downtown, there are at least 10 uh, consumer organizations who are wonderful and um, have really uh, supported us here. How do we continue to build towards our collective purpose uh, of strengthening consumer protection as you laid out in your first comment? Uh, thank you very much, Alan. I, I think there's a lot of work that we, we need to do with consumer organizations. Uh, the law provides us to work with consumer organizations, recognize them and build their profile. And that's what we have done over the years. Uh, I, I think the, if you look at not only Kenya, but Africa at large, there are different levels of uh, engagement uh, by consumer agencies with matters that affect all of us. Uh, our, our, one of our main challenges has been reaching out to consumer associations, but that reaching out of consumer association not only now confines ourselves to, to Kenya, I think we need to go across the borders and see how can consumer association work together, because with opening up of borders through digital advancement, there is a lot of shared uh, challenges and risks that come with uh, scamming, and also data privacy that uh, needs to be looked into. Uh, from consumer perspective, I think there's a lot that needs to be done, but my main action, my main uh, word for this will be, let's concretize the decisions we are making here, all the discussions and lessons that we have learned, 
let them put them into action. And our conversation shall not stop with the closing of Congress today. Very good. Perhaps we can see uh, UNCTAD, IGE, and then the OECD ministerial as the next sort of points in that journey. Um, and would certainly be love to, in love to be invited back, of course. Um, wonderful. Rebecca, how do, you, how do you see us sort of evolving, not just in 2024, but beyond? What would your suggestions and guidance be to us as NGOs, and how can we partner better um, with regulators, with enforcement agencies? You know, some of, some of our work is very much about creating those bridges and, and having the conversation because we can share rapidly and build the bridge between emerging technologies as they shoot up and the, the regulatory space? It's a great question. Um, some of what I'm going to say is going to sound a little redundant with what some of my colleagues on the stage have said, uh, which I think is a good thing, that we are all thinking about things similarly. Um, my uh, children, I have several, small, many, small children, and um, they have a book that is a favorite of theirs called Swimmy the Fish, um, and it is about <clears throat> this little fish named Swimmy. It starts out very dark, I'm just gonna warn you, uh, whose whole family gets eaten by some big tuna fish, and he's all alone in the sea, and he's very sad. And he swims off, and he tries to find a new school of fish to swim with, and he finally does. And when he finds them, he says, oh, let's go play in the ocean and play in the waves. I'm so happy to have found, you know, like-minded fish. And they say, uh, no, we're not gonna do that. There are big tuna fish out there and they're very scary. And Swimmy figures out that if they can all swim together in a formation, they can look like a much bigger fish than the scary tuna that are out there. And he's a little black fish, so he's the eye of the fish. And so he teaches them how to do that and they all swim in formation together and they scare away the fish, um, the big fish, and they uh, achieve a really important victory for themselves. What does that have to do with what we're talking about here? Um, I think about this metaphor all the time for the work of civil society and consumer advocates uh, because your voice is so important and can be easily drowned out by powerful, well-funded, industry interests often, and by working together, collaborating, cooperating, you can be enormously effective. And I think of multiple axes of collaboration and cooperation. One is intranationally, within your jurisdiction, working with other groups, maybe with overlapping interests or similar interests. Um, uh, internationally, across borders, because we see so many problems, and then between government and civil society, an enormous amount of collaboration and cooperation is valuable, and that has two elements. One is helping government do the right thing. Um, my Something we've been working on at the FTC is trying really hard to democratize the voices from whom we hear. It is our experience that um, you know, well-funded industry players don't have any problem making their opinion known to us and don't have any problem hiring lots of expensive lawyers to do that. It is much harder to hear from real people. And so consumer advocates have an enormously valuable and important role to play to make sure we're getting a balance of perspectives and helping inform our work. That's the positive side. I think the other side is you can hold our feet to the fire. Um, you, I, I invite consumer advocates to hold their regulators and enforcers accountable for the decisions that we make and the way we pursue our work to make sure that we are all centering the people that we serve in our various markets in our work. We're understanding them and we're thinking about it. Um, and then though, in terms of where do we want to be in four years, I think we often spend a lot of time playing catch up we see problems in the market and then we scramble to address them. My optimistic vision for the future is we can get ahead of the ball a little bit and you can play an enormously valuable role in issue spotting what's coming down the road for consumers. What are the problems, not just the problems of today that we're working on solving, but the problems of tomorrow that we can get ahead of. This is why I think the conversation about generative AI is enormously valuable. We. I think we've learned some important lessons from the sort of last 
20 or 30 years of online related commerce and social media of uh, the dangers of sitting back and waiting for problems to develop because then they can become very entrenched. And that's true in competition problems, it's true in consumer protection problems. So we're very tuned to saying what's coming down the road and how can we stave off peril while promoting the promise of innovative new technologies and making sure that um, we're doing as much as we can to be in that sweet spot. That's a very tall order, um, but it's not a goal we can achieve without the input, collaboration, cooperation of civil society groups around the world. Thank you. May, may I have a follow-up two-part question? One is, as I think, sort of for the next four years, even next year, I believe we have 75 elections going on around the world. How do we manage through that level of turbulence? Second, slightly connected question, but enforcement. One of the key things that consumer advocates feel is once the, the right rules are in place, they don't necessarily get enforced as well as they can be. And then we fall apart again. There is a great book, if you haven't seen it, by Hans Micklitz, who's this wonderful uh, consumer protection uh, uh, expert. I was going to say genius, but it felt a bit too, but he is. Um, he couldn't be here, but wrote a, a great blog that's on our website looking at enforcement around the world. And it's not measured, in fact, the level of, and it is part of our justice. Could you scan forward both, how do we navigate the sort of the turmoil? Um, how do we keep, sort of keep the rules in place? Yeah, it's a great question. Look, the US is one of the jurisdictions that's gonna have an election, many elections really. We'll have a presidential election plus all of our House of Representatives and a third of the Senate will be up plus many state elections throughout the country. Um, I, one of the things I like about my job is that um, I'm not in campaigns, I'm not in politics, I am, uh, you know, I'm a political appointee, but I think of myself as a civil servant and I don't have to get involved in the day-to-day -day of the political turmoil. I have a mantra, I repeat it to people at my agency all the time when we're faced with difficult decisions, which is every day, which is our job is to do the right thing in the right way for the right reasons. And to sort of put our heads down and not get caught up in the um, political, storm and drang, and I, I really believe, maybe it's wildly optimistic, but I really believe that if you do the right thing in the right way for the right reasons, then your actions will have staying power even through political changes. Um, maybe that doesn't always play out, but I, that's the world I wanna live in, so I'm gonna manifest that here right now. Um, in terms of enforcement, I think this is a really key question. Rules, that are not enforced are not meaningful. Um, and uh, bad actors notice very quickly whether rules are gonna be enforced and whether and what to what degree they can get away with not enforced, uh, not complying with them. And that's problematic from a competition perspective too because it means that uh, some businesses try to get a competitive edge by breaking rules and the businesses that are trying to do the right thing may be severely disadvantaged in the marketplace. So it, it's a whole um, panoply of problems. We are very, very focused on thinking about deterrence in our enforcement projects where we're not only remedying a specific harm that we see, but we're trying to send a clear signal to the markets that violating the law is not profitable and is not acceptable and hoping that that will incentivize broader compliance. The role of civil society in this, I think, is really key in two parts, and it's gonna sound a lot like what I said in response to the first question, which is surfacing issues for us, being the eyes and ears of enforcers on the ground is hugely important, whether that's going through, um, you know, aggregating complaints to help them go through relevant complaint portals. Um, in the US, we have a bunch of really great consumer advocates that will routinely petition us for enforcement with very detailed, I think of them as well-pleaded complaints with lots of information. Um, it doesn't have to be that sophisticated. You can just tell us what are the problems that you're seeing in the market and we can think about whether we have tools to address them with the laws that we have. And then the second point is holding our feet to the fire if you think we're not doing it. 
Um, it's a statement against interest, right? Nobody likes being criticized, but I think it's really important um, to hear when civil society thinks we're falling down on the job. Business has no problem telling us when they think we're falling down on the job. So I think, I, I actually think that public voice in the other direction is really important too and adds accountability for enforcers, which is really important. Thank you. Sheila, is there any chance in the next four years that we might be having a strategic conversation about sustainable consumption and sustainable lifestyles and what that means and seeing that being acceptable and a really sort of joined up conversation about it. Is it possible that rather than COP, we have COPEX, like everyone around the world is thinking uh, in, about how they join up sustainable consumption and production for SDG 12. Is it possible that our notion of safety, which evolves as we learn, could be imbued with green, with nature positive, with net zero, um, and all of those words? Can, can we learn, and could that be one of the things we aim for uh, in four years' time? And how do we do it? So I like the swimming the fish uh, concept because it's really having that extra voice come in so that it's not just one type of stakeholder across the life cycle of any product that is, influ is creating the influence, but rather that governments have a chance to hear all stakeholders across the full life cycle. What could be done in the next four years? I hear lots of information on eco-labels, but it's a niche market for a niche clientele. We have demands on the, from the Paris Agreement on climate and going to net zero, and a lot of industry actors are moving in this direction. We see the same on the nature side and then on the chemicals and health side. But there's a risk, as I've heard from many of you saying, it's information overload at a certain point. So what do you need to be able to say, how does this fish come together to become that big voice that really pulls all the issues into one manageable piece of information so that the consumer can make really informed choices? We have consumers who want to be part of the journey towards sustainability and what it means. We're seeing lots of industry actors looking at what does sustainability mean for their products and their services, but it's all scattered. And so your question, how does this come together? Maybe it's time to think of a global standard or a norm, an ISO type of a standard, which says, how do you look at very different pieces of information from your greenhouse gas emissions in, the, in a product that is, that is available or a service that is available, its nature footprint, its health footprint, and be able to read a label very easily beyond just knowing it has these ingredients, but something that would make sense across the globe because so many products are moving across borders. What would that take to have an ISO type of standard that is not just an e for the eco-labelers, but really for all products. So whether it's food, whether it's your, which includes your packaging, whether it's textiles, whether it's the car you buy or the batteries inside the car, there's a standardized way of looking at it that any consumer anywhere would be able to make sense out of it by just putting your phone on a QR code and thinking, oh, that's green or that's red. Perfect. Could we see a show of hands in, in sort of interest in a global label that would help consumers uh, understand the relative uh, sustainability of the of products? Is that an, uh, we have Sandra there from Consument and Bond? Yeah, we have some great great hands going up. Okay, all right, Australia, all the way through, all the way around the world. Thank you, Bob. I feel like we might be unusual suspects for you. And you might be unusual suspects for us. Angela said we should collaborate with unusual suspects. Um, are we? How, how, how have you found working with us? And what, what do you think we can do together? Uh, I think your, your aspirational question is a great question. And I, and, um, I, uh, I think there's four things I, I can, that, that we, sh we can do. I think. To working together. I think the first thing we can do is we can defeat the conventional wisdom that consumers don't care, right? And we can defeat the conventional wisdom that consumers don't care who has their data, they've surrendered 
to sort of the, the technological machine that sells them the idea that they're always better off sharing their data and that, that, that the convenience value trade-off is always in their favor. And, and that conventional wisdom isn't true. And in and, and talking with many of you and sharing the research we've done, we know that's not true. And, but it's a, a dominant conventional wisdom out there that makes it hard to make progress. And I think we can defeat the conventional wisdom. Uh, we can defeat the conventional wisdom that not only do consumers not care, that there's no cost to it. There's an enormous cost to consumers believing the system's rigged. And if we can uh, defeat the conventional wisdom through being really clear about the cost that society is burdened with because we have so many consumers who think the system's rigged against them, that's, that's a massive breakthrough. So I think number one is uh, defeating the conventional wisdom. I think the, the second one is solving for uh, what will empower consumers. And uh, Re Rebecca, the first day, was talking about click-through consent and how you, you're, you're, you're taught not to pay any attention. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm always befuddled by that because millions of dollars are spent. So when you look at your iPhone and what's on the screen, a certain behavior is elicited, right? And it has to do with the color and the format and the placement. And if we take that same powerful methodology and apply it to the question of how do we get consumers to, to act in an empowered way, we ought to be able to solve that problem. So we should solve the problem of permissioning and consent as the way to unlock uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the challenge we have that so many people feel they're disempowered, there isn't transparency. I, I think the third thing we can do is champion really concrete outcomes. Uh, you know, and, and whether it's the, the scam and, and uh, fake review issue, whether it's the uh, how do you make it easy to revoke permissions around data? I mean, these are really specific problems that we can concretely uh, uh, resolve. And then, and then lastly, um, I think we should find a way to be boldly aspirational about this, right? Because we, we, we talk about the problem around consumer uh, data empowerment and their ability to control it. Uh, you know, in a really passionate individual way. People get aggravated when they sign up for the hotel Wi-Fi and, and have to read a four-page thing that isn't quite clear about what rights they just gave away, right? Um, and I think we can flip the whole thing by being clear with ourselves about in four years, let's think of a world where what would a really empowered consumer world look like? What are the metrics about the level of trust consumers have? What are the metrics regarding, uh, do, they, do consumers understand how their data is being collected and used? The bar is so low in these places because going back to the conventional wisdom people, conventional wisdom point, so many people have given up as opposed to saying there's gigantic opportunities for bold progress and, this, and setting metrics for the ecosystem, meaning the consumers who are operating in it regarding the better world we could have. The same way we've done it with auto emissions, the same way we've done it with CO2, the same way we, we've done it with health metrics, we should do it on consumers' confidence in whether or not the, the digital commerce and data ecosystem is working for them. Perfect, thank you so much. And this is so true as sort of, you know, that consumers care, it's not showing through on a number of levels which are seen. For example, action to, uh, intention to action in sustainable buying, they do care. I think the insights we saw, you know, a quarter of people already are deeply, deeply uh, from the insights that we put together with GlobeScan. I don't know if the GlobeScan team is here, but thank you very much for helping us with a global study. Um, it just showed how much can be done. It showed how much people truly care. It's just very difficult for them to express that right now in the marketplace in the way it's set up. So both on the privacy, digital, and sustainable consumption fronts in all of those, um, we can be the channel to express that voice and change the marketplace to build trust back up. And let me just tag on to that. So we, we do consumer research every year. We've done it in at least 25 countries globally. Uh, we'd be happy to share with 
uh, your members in the specific countries, the work that we've done that shows the low level of consumer confidence, the big gaps regarding their view of whether or not companies are actually educating them, uh, the type of empowerment they'd like to have. Uh, it, it, it ought not be a corporate secret that uh, that we understand this across all these geographies. We'd be happy to share it. Uh, Thank you very much. Can I, can I just jump in to respond to something there? Because I think it's a really good point about making sure people understand what's going on for, for their data, for their health. It doesn't matter if they don't have choice. And I think one of the reasons we see widespread consumer dissatisfaction is even if people understand, and maybe they do and maybe they don't, they don't feel like they can do anything about it. And that's about how competitive our markets are, that's about what the rules of the road are, but I think it's really important from an advocacy perspective to shift from, it's not just about understanding, it's also about giving people meaningful options so that they can act on that understanding. Brilliant, thank you. Angela, I'd love to come to one of the that you have used technology to enable people. Would you have, you know, there are a number of organizations here. I think Côte d'Ivoire in particular had, you know, an app to help. I mean, it really, you, how can we use technology to support uh, people in the marketplace in the way that you've done for communities everywhere? That's a very good question. And I think it always begins with an understanding of who it is that we're engaging with. I'm a huge proponent of using appropriate technology because as technologists, we get into a space where we'll see something shiny and want to build an app and assume that that's going to work. And most of the time, it likely will not. And so it really requires a very deep understanding of what tools do the, the consumers have access to? What spaces are they engaging in? Um, who, who have, you know, what level of trust do they also have established? Um, and what expectations are we creating when we use these apps to engage with them. Um, and this is one of the reasons why we've had a mobile first approach to building our tools, right? You'll have someone like my grandmother who might not have access to a smartphone, but will still be able to engage um, by sending an SMS or us being able to send a message back. But for somebody who's in an urban area, then making use of smartphone applications. So it it's something that's really dependent on a deep understanding of who it is you want to engage with and making that an iterative process as well. What is it that works for you? What is it that works for us? In what forms do you want this information presented to you? Because that also happens to be the other challenge, especially when we're talking about understanding. Are we presenting people with 10 pages of terms and conditions? Or are we um, you know, summarizing that into something that actually makes sense? Being able to clearly understand that if I buy this product, this is the impact that it'll have on the environment right now and have this effect downstream for me and my people. Brilliant, thank you so much. Now, we're going to come to the audience now. We have been sort of warming you up a bit with some Slido. So because the, the panel, um, it's difficult for us to see, I'll just say, we asked them what are the top topics? No, well, what are the greatest opportunities? One was that the top came influencing policymakers and on the top topics, cost of living crisis, of course. Um, so we are trying to go through all of these crises whilst uh, experiencing a cost of living crisis, which is uh, consumers are bracing themselves. Um, so we'll come back to the panel, but I do want to see if there are questions in the audience. Would you please raise your hand? A mic will be brought to you. Um, if you do ask a question, please state who you are. And I'm going to be terribly rude, but brevity is the soul of wit. So in order to get as many questions in, keep your question brief. I am strict on that. We have a question here with Felicia. We have a question over there with David, I believe. Don't be shy. I will call on you as well. And with uh, uh, Deepti in the middle. Perfect. Felicia, please. OK, Helena, thank you. Thank you, everyone. In fact, uh, they have ex um, expressed very important views. But I won't, just want to talk about Introduce one. yourself. But, oh, yes. I'm Felicia Monye, um, a professor of law at the University of Nigeria in the campus. And I'm the president of Consumer Awareness Organization, Nigeria. Uh, so um, one area that I, I feel we should um, uh, promote 
in the coming years is this consumer awareness that they have mentioned. But I just want to be specific on the uh, particular areas. One, cost-effective redress channels. Because uh, from experience, we've seen that consumers are reluctant to uh, enforce their rights if they need to spend money, like going to court to enforce their rights. But if we create awareness and show consumers that there are some cost-effective redress channels, they will be interested in doing that. For instance, just making a report to the service provider, to the uh, regulator. If the service prov provider or the product uh, supplier does not cooperate, then you know the next place to go to, and that's the, the regulator or the industry, uh, uh, industry in charge. Then another thing is this uh, digital divide. We need to talk about it, because if you go to some countries, including Nigeria, you see that in the cities, many people are aware of their rights. Many people are also um, have access to different things, maybe the uh, telecommunication services and others. But in the villages, you see that the reverse is the case. Then we can be talking, of course, financial inclusion. You go to the villages, you don't have many people key into that. But in the cities, the reverse is the case. So we need to uh, treat this, uh, uh, this uh, digital divide with the seriousness it, is, it deserves. Let me stop because of time. Thank you. Excellent comments. I said, David, it's Augustine, right? Sorry. Sorry. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Austin Reina from BEUC, the European Consumer Organization. Could you speak up? We can't hear you well. Yes. Can you hear me now? Speak better? Hello, Not hello, hello. great. Not great. We can... Do we have another mic? Closer there? Better. Better. That's better. Super. Thank you. Austin Reina from BEUC, the European Consumer Organization. Thank you again for such a fantastic Congress. Really has been a very inspiring, inspiring uh, three days. I will have a, a question to the two uh, competition agencies uh, in the, in, on the stage um, concerning the cost of living crisis and corporate concentration. Four major companies control from 70 to 90% of the grain world market. And we are seeing today that the cost of living crisis is affecting absolutely everybody. I come from Europe, and I can tell you that has a deep impact on food prices in the supermarkets. People, many people, are, households are, are struggling, and this is a reality that is repeated across the world. One of the sources of this has related to the fact that markets have become more concentrated. So my question, which probably is not a very easy to answer, is what can we do about it? Especially looking at uh, what competition authorities can, can do this with us. Thank you. Very good question. I think we had Deep Tea next, who's in the middle there, hand up. And we can gather one more, and then we'll come back to the, oh, lots. Uh, Nada, I think, in the front row from Lebanon. Anybody over here? Yeah, you have one. I'll come to you in the second round. Hi, um, thank you so much. Uh, this is Deepti George from Dwara Research. We're a financial inclusion focused research and policy think tank, uh, very much focused on financial sector approaches to uh, just uh, better financial inclusion. Um, so I think, and we are building a portfolio of uh, solutions that uh, can solve customer protection issues in uh, digital financial services. That's really financial services, any. Um, any financial service for that matter. Uh, my question was, um, or, or rather it's an observation, I think one big piece that we are missing, uh, which we can use to strengthen our repertoire of tools and solutions and collaborations is to also introduce uh, very deliberately uh, the, the, uh, the solutions that can come from using human-centered design. Uh, so design, uh, in, for example, in inter digital interfaces is something that isn't, uh, that is uh, almost considered as part of whatever is the, the problem that we are thinking about, but it's not really thought about, uh, uh, you know, from an overarching sense. Uh, so maybe strategically incorporating the role of design in our solutions uh, might be, uh, it will just strengthen the effort. Thanks. Perfect, thank you. And maybe just, uh, yeah, Nada to the left. Thank you, uh, Nada Nami uh, from uh, Lebanon. Uh, thanks for uh, this, all the subjects which are introduced, it's very important. But we have to discuss something that's a living cause. It's due to the instability. The only way to protect the consumer is stop the war. Stop the war all around the world. 
in 2023, there is a consumer which are no access to the food, to the health, to the drug. So we need the stability to be aware from the food system, financial, etc., and to have a safe transition to the safe energy. In this conflict, we didn't have any solution for all our difficulty to live, okay? I have a question for the labeling. It's important to have a international standard for the labeling concerning the product and all the service all around the world. Like the ISO certificate, we can use it in all product and we are aware as a consumer's organization to distribute it to the consumer. Thank you. Thank you, Nada. And I think a gentleman uh, just here, yes, can we pass the mic forward? Oh, hi, I'm Nelson from Strathmore. Uh, quick question to the panel. Do you think we should focus more on stability and consumer education or more on to produce uh, in, uh, information and education to reduce their production costs so that the consumer is able to afford more stability initiatives and products compared to now the traditional and in an environmental friendly products. Thank you very much. And you're one of our wonderful um, guests from Strathmore Business University, which is, uh, of, of course, a wonderful business university here in uh, Kenya. And thank you very much to Rosemary uh, Okello Olale for uh, having brought um, uh, students to be able to start the next generation of consumer advocates and consumer advocates fighting within consumer organizations. So I hope you stay with us. Um, right, quite a range of questions there. Um, I will ask first if any of you would like to respond to any of those questions in particular. Jump, Rebecca. Yeah, I think Augustine and the question we just heard about um, Prices, stability, this is, I, I totally agree. This is at the front of everybody's mind right now. How do we think about it? How do we deal with it? You're speaking my language when you're talking about the role that corporate concentration plays in price issues. It is not the only issue at all. And uh, sometimes when you talk about the role of concentration in inflation, people say, oh, you're misunderstanding all the other issues. I am not. I understand that these compl these questions are complicated and nuanced, but yes, concentration has a role. It also has a role in leading to instability in markets. We had an absolute crisis in baby formula in the United States last year because there was a supply chain disruption in one of three major baby formula makers, and it meant babies did not get fed in the United States of America in 2022 and 2023. It's horrifying because we don't have redundancy and resiliency in our supply chains. Um, I think the question about um, our, should we be worried more about production costs versus uh, reducing consumer costs is an important one. If the data suggested that increasing costs of production was primarily responsible for the increase in consumer pricing, then I would say yes, that's something we should focus on. And I think it's very true that the cost of borrowing, high interest rates and the cost of borrowing does contribute to higher production costs, but we are also seeing extremely high profit margins uh, in, from these companies in the highly concentrated industries that are not tied to increase in production costs. And so that's what should make us say, no, competition is not working effectively in these markets to discipline prices and price rises are being unattached to increases in costs of production and therefore need to be addressed from a competition perspective. What you do about it is a much harder question. Um, you know, we have tools to tackle anti-competitive conduct. We have tools to tackle anti-competitive mergers. By the time we're at an oligopoly industry, it's very difficult to unwind that um, if we don't have evidence of specific monopoly maintenance conduct or um, collusive cartel behavior. Um, so that's a real, real challenge that we're facing. And I think it's where sometimes we have to go back to policymakers and legislatures and say, 
this is not a problem that ex post enforcement can necessarily solve. It is a problem, but we have to be mindful of, about what the limitations of the tools that we have are. I think we have a, a very valuable role to play and advocates have a very valuable role to play in shining light on the issues and doing it in a nuanced, data-driven way that reflects market realities and not you know, aspirational views of what we think the markets are doing, um, but we can't actually solve all the problems. Um, you know, people, people uh, accuse me and other advocates of zealous antitrust enforcement of thinking that, you know, antitrust is the hammer for every particular nail, and I actually think it really isn't. I think we could use it for more nails than we have in the past, but it, it is not the right one for everything. So uh, I think it's an important part of the conversation, one we have to address, um, and I'm not sure that ex post enforcement is always the best way to do it. Perhaps Adano, would you like to respond to the, the points on corporate concentration? Yeah, uh, I would like to respond to the, 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 the question on uh, consumer education as well. Uh, the, 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 one of the main concerns that uh, we have is uh, with regard to resources that uh, are needed for uh, consumer creating consumer awareness or education. Uh, it's it's a question of whether uh, that approach will be sustainable or not. And what we have done is uh, to take a step further and see how can we make uh, consumer education more sustainable uh, moving forward. And what we have done is to partner with uh, institutions that are responsible for developing curriculums for for schools, and we have incorporated consumer education uh, elements within the school curriculum in, in Kenya, such like that moving forward, uh, as uh, youths of today grow up, they are more conversant with consumer issues and they're able to articulate what are the issues that affect them and they grow up knowing that these are part of their rights and they need to know. Uh, in that way, then we are able to bypass the issue of resource requirement now and move forward in terms of future, seeing that uh, uh, future adults are more aware of, uh, of their rights and therefore they are more able to articulate. The, the, the other question on uh, uh, competition enforcement, uh, I think I, I, I agree with the Rebecca's uh, uh, view that uh, we, we have a role to play when it comes to, uh, uh, for example, the mergers uh, being brought to the authority, but in most cases, those are not instances where they, they are brought to the attention of the authority. Then the other option is to look at observe market how it behaves in terms of those dominant entities uh, abusing their dominance. And I think that's where the competition law become uh, more relevant in applying the law to ensure that uh, ab uh, abusive uh, dominance behavior are not allowed. And therefore there's a tool, they allow, the law allows us to apply the law as it is and therefore enforce and ensure that prices uh, are transmitted only when uh, cost of input are higher, not as a result of collusive behavior where a few entities or dominant farms within the market uh, collude to increase prices. And in that instance, then the competition law has a role to play. Very good. Could I ask, we had questions on the digital divide, how do we close it, and human-centered design. I don't know if Bob or Angela might like to sort of, how do, how do you approach that? How, how can, and how can consumer advocates sort of improve uh, the digital or close the digital divide um, and what should we be considering in terms of human-centered design? I, mean, I feel like I'm going to be repeating my, my, my earlier comment. I think it's really about um, rethinking what our definition of innovation actually is um, and identifying interesting ways of engaging with the tools that we already have that will meet people where they are. It's all about meeting people where they are. Um, and in cases where <clears throat> we have, let me try and think about how to frame this. In cases where um, emerging technologies um, are more prevalent, I think being aware of that gap and finding other ways of, of engaging, and I'm specifically thinking around artificial intelligence and the fact that you know people in urban areas are likely the ones who are going to be interacting with it larger than the people who are in the villages. So how are we thinking about consumer protection when it comes to that? How are we thinking about um, education and awareness? How are we thinking about um, provision of services? Or are we further exacerbating the divide by continuing to move along uh, with everything else. I 
honestly, the simple answer is meet people where they are. And that's where the idea of human-centered design comes in. It's really about engaging with those communities and identifying where they engage, what tools they have access to. And in cases where we, we need to rethink that, then are we providing financing to provide them with access to some of that some of that infrastructure. And maybe that's the place of government as well to also think about infrastructural development around some of these uh, low income areas to make sure that we're not leaving people behind. Very good. Gilly, you wanted to make a comment? I want to respond quickly about you know the digital divide. Um, obviously, it is a harm to consumers, especially the vulnerable ones. Um, the more divide we are in the society, the more harm you know, we are going to create in the society. So um, we have uh, done quite a bit of study in Hong Kong you know, to talk about a subject. And it is so important for the government to have the civil societies as well, to have very specific programs targeting at the vulnerable ones on how to close that digital divide gap. Um, to a large extent, it's about education. But on the other hand, um, if uh, they don't have that confidence and also people that they can affiliate with, you know, to educate them, uh, no matter how great the program is, you know, it is a big failure. So what I think is, um, apart from uh, having very dedicated programs to help the vulnerable ones to reduce, you know, the gap of the digital divide, another area that you know we really have to advocate for is for all the technology service providers no matter they are handheld device um, um, developers um, or you know the uh, telecom operators they have to design very friendly product that can meet the basic understanding of the vulnerable ones which I think you know it is very important and um, the more you know uh, that we push forward you know this uh, about you know the unfriendliness about on their on their products the better it is you know in future in closing that gap perfect i think we've got time for another three questions we have one here from c gap i think my eyesight is going oh dear Hello, hi, my name is Juan Carlos Iseguirre. I'm uh, working for CIGAP, Financial Inclusion, Think and Do Tank, host of the World Bank. Um, and I have a, a couple of, of com oh, comments and questions. On the one hand, in the financial service, I think one of the challenges we've seen is consumer protection hasn't been that effective in the past 20 plus years. I was a banking supervisor in Peru and working on consumer protection issues in the past 20 years. So one of the challenges we're seeing is that Authorities many times are just looking at the stability and the soundness of financial institutions, but not necessarily going to the next mile and looking at the results of those actions of providers onto the consumers, so the customer outcomes. Whereas financial institutions are more looking at profitability and other aspects, but not necessarily at the results of their actions on consumers. So we are talking, for example, in CGAP, the importance of monitoring markets for consumer risks identification of consumer risk and consumer outcomes. At the same time, the other important point for us is how to help coordination, collaboration, and dialogue among regulators, private sector entities, industry associations, consumer organizations, to kind of think about a common language, something to work together so that we get rid of you know, the previous way of thinking and previous way of, of, of acting. So any comment from your side on how to break those typical way of thinking and acting to think about better ways to address consumer protection issues, consumer risks and outcomes, especially in the digital financial world. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. And we have a gentleman here. Mike is coming to you. One there, and there's a gentleman here before, but Antonino, can, yeah, sure. Thank you very much, Elena. First, let me congratulate you and all the team of Consumers International for a splendid Congress, really great sessions, really great discussions. Um, you mentioned in your words that um, ahead we have some very important uh, moments where we can influence policymakers, which is the first one there in the opportunities that we have as a movement. I think that the fact that UNCTAD has declared that the main issue of the next intergovernmental group of experts meeting next July in Geneva is how to empower consumer groups is a, uh, 
It's a moment that we don't have to miss to try to influence policymakers and to put all these issues that we discussed today and these panelists are saying and, and the people on the floor uh, to be in the agenda of governments and in policymakers and also decision makers all over the world. You mentioned also the OECD ministerial. I should say that we should add something like the G20 in Brazil uh, that hopefully will bring consumer voice again. So we, we are in a very important and great moment and this Congress will, will give us a lot of food to bring forward to influence that. Thank you very much. Excellent. That's very kind of you. And the gentleman just in front here, yes. Um, thank you very much. Sajeev and I are from Cuts International, Zambia. Uh, mine is more of a basic question about the digital uh, financial services as well as the regulatory framework, which Angela was mentioning about. We are not catching up fast enough to address the regulatory framework. In the case of Zambia, where we have 70% of people are enrolled in the mobile mo money network. But when it comes to redressal, when you have a challenge, people are running from pillar to post. You go to police, you go to the SICTA, the communication regulator, you go to the, the financial provider, and at the end of the day, you are moving in a circle. And the, even the regional institution like Commercial Competition Authority, it is basically dealing with the competition issues and not much in the digital and also the regulatory framework and the communication. And, and how do you address that basic challenges which we face at that level of you know, digital consumer protection? Thank you. Excellent point. And also following, of course, from what Felicia said earlier about redress. So how do we improve the lived experience by bringing the right regulators together? And both questions on digital finance, so high on the agenda, uh, improving the lived experience and redress then when that lived experience is fairly poor. Bob, because we're working together on this, um, yeah, how, would, how are we going to look at that and how would you put that, our work, in a broader perspective as well? I think it goes a little bit back to Angela's previous answer on uh, UX and engineering uh, in that I think there's, there's two big things we can do. Uh, one is have a, a, a really clear, detailed understanding of how the system actually works, right? And, and, and strip away the opaqueness that lets lots of actors, you know, hide or uh, be less straightforward about how the system actually works. So if we, if we map out how the system actually works, how the money actually flows, how the permissions actually go from one party to another party, uh, what's the nature of the contractual relationships, be clear about that. And then I think the second part of it is be specific about the, the, the problem we're trying to solve, right? So if the, uh, if the problem is we're trying to f solve is a whole set of consumers are not participating in a system, solve the problem of how to get them to participate in the system. And in and, and the, and the work we do, uh, you know, everyone always talks about the the aggregate growth rates and the aggregate statistics. But we also know that 35% of consumers in almost every country does not yet participate in digital commerce in any way. Now, the reason varies from country to country, but it's almost always 35%, right? So clearly the options those consumers have today are not options they want. So we need to, we need to come up with a, a solution for their participation that they'll embrace. And I think that comes from understanding in a granular way how the system actually works. And then for those who are not participating, solve the problem for them. Because there's a reason they're not participating. They don't see the options they want. And, and I think we can get there through sort of detailed uh, collaborative problem solving around the group that is not in the system, that, that is not included, that we need to give them an option that brings them in. Um, so one thought that just uh, crossed into my mind, I was, I was going to say collaboration, but it feels like a, a word that we've kind of over-repeated. So trying to think about practically what exactly would that look like? And I thought about her Deep T's comment on human-centered design and this idea of ensuring that 
we have civil society, consumer advocates, and government um, working together to develop policies. What would that look like in a less reactive manner? How, how do we get to a proactive space? Does that look like um, you know, digital financial institutions building these tools with all of these different representation of all of these different stakeholders? You have a government representative, you have somebody from the consumer advocate side, um, you have civil society as well, so that you're factoring in all of the different things that need to be taken into account that also plants the seeds in the minds of the policy makers, as opposed to we've developed the tool, it's out there in the wild, people are using it, oops, we have a problem, we need to fix it, and then we're kind of coming in and patching things up. So I don't have the answer to it. It feels very idealistic, but maybe that's the space that we need to move into where um, building the tools themselves and designing them does take into account all of the stakeholders, and similarly, um, in the policy space as well at the very onset rather than in the middle of the life cycle. Thank you so much. Gilly, I think it's our role to try and sum up uh, what we've heard. Um, how would you, what would you, what messages do you take away as we now go into our General Assembly and bringing our members together uh, for the rest of this afternoon? Okay, I want to address two points first. And first, I want to address about a digital uh, financial risk issue that just quite some uh, audience you know raised the questions. Frankly speaking, from my point of view, there's no magic formula in resolving this. The most important thing is the regulator really have to come together uh, and impose very stringent requirements to govern the behavior of the industry in selling the products. No matter is um, uh, monetary authorities and also the security finance. Uh, Authorities, they really have to impose you know, stringent requirements on that. But one thing you know, that we, all of us in the room, you know, can really do, but don't ignore the importance of it, is the education to consumers about their digital finance safety. Um, don't laugh about it. You know, think about the consumers that are just average people on the street. Sometimes you know, they really ignore certain very simple behavior that they can protect themselves but they don't do the behavior. For example, accessing your bank account via public Wi-Fi. You don't have uh, MFA to safeguard uh, your, your mobile phone. Or even, you know, uh, you don't have complex uh, passwords. Things like that, you know, it seems it's very normal and very easy for all of us in the room because we are a more knowledgeable group of uh, people using uh, digital finance. But in, reali in reality, in many markets, even very advanced market, highly educated people, their ignorance really caused harm to themselves. So I do believe, you know, while we are pushing for stronger advocacy, it is so important that, you know, we educate the public about, you know, their own uh, governance on their own behavior. And the second question is about, you know, the takeaway. Um, then, you know, we have to think about, you know, four years ago, what happened with CI, every one of us uh, is, as I'm, mentioned at the beginning, we encounter a very challenging and difficult time. And what we are uh, happening to CI is, CI is transforming. Frankly, you know, transforming through a very difficult time. Transforming from having even more members, transforming to have a very centralized office in UK to become a really globalized team in the world. Uh, transforming to be a very highly rely on the membership fund organization to become a more diversified um, membership organiza uh, organization on consumer protection. It is a very, very difficult and challenging road uh, in the past four years. And in the next four years, what is going to happen is it will continue to transform. And that transformation is not just CI. What I feel is, is every one of us in the room, including regulators, including all the um, uh, civil societies, our members, we are all transforming because the world is transforming, the consumption environment is transforming. If we are not transform ourselves, we are really behind. We are not follow the momentum of consumer protection. So um, I think you know the next four years will be extremely challenging for every one of us. And that's why you know it is so even more important for us to channel our energy not just only dealing with your national issues, which I know every one of you, when we talk you know, in private, you are already extremely exhausted in dealing with your heavy workload on all the national issues, but don't lose oversight on the global issues that 
it's so important for us to spare the energy and channel our energy to focus on the key focus areas you know, that we have identified already, have a lot of dialogue in the last few days, that you know, we have to really work together to have concrete deliverables, as Bob you know, rightly pointed out, to deliver. The consumers, they are very simple. They feel the works that we have done. If we have made them feel you know, they are happy, they're confident in spending on certain areas, that means you know, we achieve our work. Uh, we, couldn't lose over, we couldn't lose the sight of uh, the basic principles of consumer rights. The rights to have safe product, the right to have um, redress, the right to have information, the right you know, to have uh, sustainability. All these you know, are very fundamental to consumers that even though no matter how much we change, we change according to their basic rights. So I think you know, the next four years will be extremely challenging for everyone. Uh, but again and again, we are all consumer. You want to be happy. You want to have confidence in spending. And that's very important to remind us to, uh, to deliver the mission uh, with all our effort together. Thank you, Gilly. So please join me in thanking our panelists. And then I have a few extra thanks to go. Please stand. So um, we must raise our voice collectively. We must show that consumers care. That is crucial because it's the basis of trust in the marketplace. And we have so many like-minded partners and friends that we can work with. Um, please excuse me. I do have to stay seated when I would love to be in the middle of the stage thanking um, and, uh, all of those who have supported us through this process. I will personally be learning to swim uh, because I can't run, um, as you'll have seen uh, with crutches around. Um, so please do do excuse me. It is with sincere gratitude that we thank uh, the Competition Authority of Comesa. Uh, Willard Mwemba uh, has been instrumental in uh, helping us hold this Congress. The Government of, Ken of the Republic of Kenya, in particular the Competition Authority of Kenya and Adano and his team. Uh, we have... We should, of course, mention Alexia and Boniface and uh, Kondwani and the fantastic team who have been uh, with us throughout the journey. Um, I'd like to thank our members. Um, in particular, I would first, I would love our African members to stand um, so that we can celebrate them. And then after this, I think we need a photo of you. Would you please stand? Um, we are thrilled to have worked with you to bring Congress uh, to Kenya and to the African continent. Thank you, and stay for the, the photo. This is important. Um, I would like to thank two organizations, Choice Australia and FOMCA, uh, because they stepped forward at the very uh, start of this process, and that enabled us to launch building a Congress. There were times during the pandemic when we didn't know if we could. Um, so uh, thank you, sincere thanks. Um, so many others have rallied around us to make this possible, um, and that is through everything from the lanyards, that, the beautiful lanyards that you're wearing, to the side events, to the insight that we've been given, um, to just making this entirely possible. It really has been a, a joint event. Um, so I'm going to uh, share FSD Kenya, sincere thanks, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Ford Foundation, Globescan, Senfree joining us from South Africa. Um, we have, of course, Visa, uh, the government of Germany. I said Ulf before, I should have said the government of Germany. Please, pro all protocols observed, please forgive me. Um, the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth, Amazon, um, the Alan Turing Institute, CLASP, our friends at UNCTAD, the OECD, and of course, UNEP. Um, the Strathmore Business School and Consument and Bond, who uh, held the most amazing uh, workshop, of course, on collective claims here, which uh, I think was standing room only. Um, I would like to thank the interpreters, who I, I always think this is incredibly important. Can you imagine? You know, they asked for a glossary of terms before, and we were like, hmm. Yeah, that's pretty broad. So thank you so much for helping us make this um, an inclusive uh, event. Um, 
And if I may indulge, perhaps we could ask the Consumers International team to stand up. Um, in 10 countries, I don't know if you have. Yeah, we, have, we, are in, we are across 10 countries. We do have mission control. Hello, I know you're there. You have been amazing getting up at 3 a.m. or earlier to be able to make this an inclusive event joining across from, the new, from Brazil, uh, I think, yes, around the world during this, uh, this week. So with that, thank you sincerely. <laughs> So with that, thank you sincerely for being such wonderful participants and more than that, partners and uh, friends uh, through these three days together. We are perhaps, at least our heads are in the game for the next four years. We look forward to seeing you, we know not where, stand up if you would like to be the next uh, host for the Global Congress 2027 by which time I will have learned to swim much better. And to all of you, stay safe, stay well, stay together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well done. Should we do it?